Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Palestine Exploration Fund. My name is Michael Talbot, and I'm the Honorary Secretary here. And it's a pleasure to invite you here, to, or to welcome you here this evening, to hear a talk by the wonderful Michael Press. Now, Michael joins us um, from Aga University in Norway, where he's a postdoctoral researcher on a beautifully named project, The Lying Pens of Scribes, which is looking <laughs> at manuscript forgeries and critical provenance studies. And Michael's work, which forms part of this project, is looking at antiquities and the antiquities market in 19th century Palestine. Now, I should also say about Michael is that he is probably one of the most important public historians of the history of Palestine at the moment. He does amazing work through international press and magazines, and especially on social media, to highlight many of the issues around collections and collecting related to antiquities from Palestine. Um, so it's with great pleasure to welcome you here, Michael. I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Over to you. All right, thank you for that introduction. Thank you all for coming. Um, so for those of you who were here last week for, um, for Anne Caldwell's lecture, um, we're gonna be kind of continuing on sort of the same theme of travel. And so I want you to imagine that you are a tourist traveling to Palestine in the 19th century, say 1890. All right. So let me get my clicker. Very important. And here we are. So we're coming down from Britain. We're at a port, maybe Marseille, Trieste, going through the Mediterranean to Alexandria, and then going to end on, on towards um, Palestine. And we're going through the water, and we're maybe imagining all these wonderful things we're going to see in, if we stop in Egypt or wherever we are in the east. And uh, finally, we see some land. Now, you can imagine that the boat is kind of <laughs> rocking a little back and forth as we approach. Um, and there we are. There we are at Jaffa, and we are approaching the port. But let's stop rocking. Here we are, and as we get closer, we see a problem. There are all these rocks in the harbor. Jaffa has, is a notorious, in the 19th century, having this bad harbor where you can't actually bring a large ship to. So um, you have to anchor maybe a mile off the coast. Um, but of course, if it's bad weather, you can't even do that. And so the ship you're on it has to keep going on to Beirut or on to Alexandria, depending which way you're going. But if you're lucky, um, you can anchor and then the rowboats will come. All these rowboats full of dragomans, these people who want to offer you their services to conduct the, you around the country. Um, and it's this mad rush of people coming on your ship and trying to grab your luggage and grab you and get you in their boat and bring you to the shore. Let's see if we can do um, the video. So we have a little video here from Palestine in 1896. Here we are. A Jaffa. So here we are getting on, um, onto shore, on into the, in the harbor. All right. Now we've gotten there, and of course, one of the things now we're traveling around Palestine. What do we want to do? We want to get souvenirs. We want to bring stuff home. Now, what do we want to buy? Well, um, it's worth remembering that in the 19th century, throughout the entire century, most of the people who are going to the country are not secular tourists; they're pilgrims especially Orthodox pilgrims, also a lot of Catholic pilgrims. And the things they want to buy are things like this. You see, we've got rosaries, beads, um, crucifixes, lots of things made out of um, olive wood, mother of pearl. And these are kind of the number one um, types of objects for sale. These, what are sometimes referred to in French as objets de piété, objects of piety. And the same thing goes for tourists. So even if you're not, even if you don't think that these are objects or anything special, they are a souvenir you want to bring back to remind you of your trip to Palestine. It's what Palestine is known for. Um, and there's other kind of tourist things too, the kinds of things you might imagine, books, photographs. So we have an album here from the 1890s, nice olive wood cover. And it's an album of flowers and pictures of the Holy Land. So you get that same view of Jaffa that we just saw as you approach it. And you get things like this. You get pressed flowers in the book. Um, and these are kind of standard um, souvenirs that you might pick up in Palestine if you're traveling there around 1890. Um, 
So now, where are you going to buy your souvenirs? So if you want those kinds of souvenirs, you can get them in places like right up front of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. So you see in this picture, we have all these vendors who are just sitting there with their wares, these kinds of objects that you can just buy. Or you can go to a series of shops in Jerusalem um, because a number of different dealers sell these things to you. And this is just inside Jaffa Gate. We'll see more of that in a minute. Um, or you can go to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is very famous for producing these kinds of objects in the 19th century. Um, and of course, it is a major um, spot for both tourists and pilgrims, especially at the time of festivals. But what about if you want to buy antiquities? Because even though these other objects are kind of the most common things to buy, many people want to buy antiquities too. And you can buy those in different kinds of places. So, for instance, if you're in the Galilee, you can go to Tiberias or Nazareth, which are, of course, important sites in antiquity. But they're also among the largest towns in the Galilee in this period. They each had several thousand people. Uh, you can see fairly large towns in the period. Going further south into um, the hill country, a site like Samaria, important ancient history. Also, a modern village, Sebastia at the spot. Or we can go down to the southern hill country to Ashkelon. It's a site that had been a major city in antiquity. It had been um, abandoned for several hundred years by 1890, but there was a village just outside its walls and several other villages and a large town um, within a few kilometers. So basically what we see from this is you can buy antiquities more or less throughout the country, up in the north, in the center, in the south. You can buy them in cities, towns, villages, even ancient sites where there was no longer a village at the, at the site itself. But of course, the number one place we want to buy antiquities is Jerusalem itself, one of the largest cities in the country, and it's of course where all the pilgrims and tourists want to go. <coughs> so this leads us to our next point. How do you find your sellers? Well, this might not be that hard if you're really looking for antiquities. Um, here we have a map of the old city. We can zoom in, and we are now looking at the Christian Quarter. And so, for instance, let's start up top here, the Via Dolorosa, um, one of the prime uh, pilgrim and tourist spots. Not necessarily a major spot for antiquities. What's more important here, you have um, Christian Quarter Road, was usually called the 19th century Christian Street, running by the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, and in the 1860s and 1870s in particular, this is, you start getting a lot of what are called European style shops. Shops, as opposed to the traditional ones where you would just have a merchant sitting outside a stall and you would come and they would grab their wares and offer them to you. These are shops where you could actually enter, where you might have goods displayed in cases. And one of the important shops in the 1870s in particular uh, is the shop of the notorious um, antiquities dealer and bookseller Moses Shapira located there. And you can see this is what it looks like today. Um, but by 1890, if you want to look for antiquities, the place you want to go is the area around Jaffa Gate. And it's kind of square just inside Jaffa Gate. And even you start getting shops on Jaffa Road going outside of the city. Or outside of the old city, I should say. Um, so let's do this one more time. Let's see if I can find the right spot. Here we are, just inside Jaffa Gate in 1896, looking out west to the gate. You see we have a bread seller or something in the foreground here and people walking by. All right. So that gives you a taste of what you might have encountered around 1890. And, and still here, Jaffa Gate, this area just inside, and around the gate is really the commercial center of Jerusalem in this period, and it's the tourist center. You can see all of these shops um, selling articles in olive wood, photographs, curiosities. You see um, in the background we have, the, we have Thomas Cook's office in Jerusalem. So this is really a major hub for buying all kinds of souvenirs, including antiquities. Um, one of the buildings to highlight is this building right here, which was opened in the 1880s as the Grand New Hotel. It's now the Imperial Hotel. And if you walk through the doorway, you think you're going to walk into the hotel. What you actually see is a gallery of shops. 
This is a plan made by Conrad Schick, published in the PEF's quarterly statement. And you can see all those different shops on the ground floor of this building. And if we look at the outside of it in the 1890s, we focus on this shop right here. And that is the shop of uh, Frederick Vester. He's known for selling goods in olive wood. You can see that highlighted prominently on the sign. But if you look kind of towards the bottom, I don't know how well it shows up. Here it says antiquities. All right, so you can go um, to these sellers of olive wood and mother of pearl goods, these souvenirs who will also sometimes have um, antiquities. If you're lucky, you can even look them up in your travel guide. Here is one from 1890 in German. And right under we have these kinds of pilgrim and tourist goods. We have ancient coins. And you can go to um, a man named Giorgio Scapolato who had a shop right about in Jaffa Gate. And in addition to selling these kinds of um, objets de piété, you could also buy ancient coins from him and also from another man here, Giovanni Battista Aldengo. Maybe you can find people in ads, like this um, ad from a uh, Hebrew almanac in the mid-1890s. And if you'll note, at the bottom here, we have Samuel Rafalovich and Chaim Lipkin, money exchanger and dealers in antiquities. This is when people start to advertise themselves as antiquities dealers in the 1890s in Palestine. Um, so we have another um, occupation, not just the sellers of objets de piété, we also have these um, money changers who might also sell you ancient goods such as coins. And you can just go to the marketplaces, not just in Jerusalem, but around um, the country. And one of the people you look for are the goldsmiths. And for instance, we have a Christian goldsmith in the village of Mejdel near Ashkelon, who's also a dealer in antiquities. Um, in Hebron, a goldsmith who buys all the antiquities found in the neighborhood as far as Gaza and Ashkelon and as far as salt on the other side of the Jordan. Um, we have goldsmiths in Nablus, where you can buy um, engraved gems like that. Or you can go to the goldsmiths in Gaza, and maybe you can find something nice like this um, stone fish, which is now in the Louvre. Um, but you can find other people in the marketplace who might sell you antiquities too. In this case, we have a rabbi in Tiberias who besides selling manuscripts, also sells ancient coins, apparently. Here's the thing. Sometimes you don't even have to go looking for these sellers. Sometimes they'll come looking for you. So for instance, we have this man in the 1870s telling us that um, these sellers would congregate outside the hotels. And in fact, at a certain point, usually after dinner, they would be let in, and all these different dealers would be offering you things such as arrows with serene lamps, which they gratified by calling um, antiques, but which it required no great penetration to see were made and baked in 1873 instead of 500 BC. Or, if you were traveling around the country, especially outside of the large cities, you're going to be in tents, and they'll come to your tents and offer you, in this case, a German traveler being offered glass vessels from Tyre and Tiberias. Um, or if you're just walking around, and the local residents might offer you things. So for instance, here's William Cowper Prime, who was a prominent travel writer in the 1850s, talking about going to um, Silwan. And the prospect of a purchaser brought down all the youth of a village, and I soon had literally hundreds of coins offered to me. And this is an experience recounted again and again in traveler accounts at the time. Here he talks again the same thing going on at Samaria, modern Sebastia. And you can even buy things from pilgrims themselves. So not only are the pilgrims buying things when they go to Palestine, they're also bringing things to sell. Because you go on a pilgrimage, it's very expensive. Um, you might be there for months, and you need to finance your journey. So what do you do? You bring old coins, other kinds of antiques, and you sell them. So for instance, um, here we have a coin collector and a missionary, Henry Reichardt, who warns that um, just because you find a coin in Palestine doesn't mean it was actually uh, minted there. It could have been brought from abroad. Here in another instance, we have a traveler 
at the plain of Akko on the northern um, part of the country, and Armenian pilgrims offer him an ancient coin. All right, so we know the different cities or towns or villages to go to. We know how to find some of these different sellers and who they are. Now, what are we going to buy? And we've already got some hints of that. So, for instance, we can buy coins. Here are a series of silver shekels. Um, these were found um, in what was said to be a hoard somewhere near Jerusalem in 1874, and these are now in the British Museum. But there's a problem because, as we read already in the 1850s, there is a brisk manufacture of this coin carried on in Jerusalem for the benefit of travelers. So, you find your silver shekels. Are they real? Are they not? Who knows? Another thing that was circulating at that time is this coin right here. Thought said to be an ancient coin. We have on one side, we have a picture of Moses with his horn. Um, and on the other side, we have in Hebrew, not um, the earliest Hebrew script either, the second commandment. Um, and this was a very popular coin offered to travelers in the middle years of the 19th century. Um, so if you're buying coins, especially if you're buying gold and silver coins, you have to be on the lookout. Now, one of the things is most of the coins that you'll come across are copper coins, and they're so common and often so corroded um, that they weren't even worth forging because you could get them for nothing. So, for instance, there is one traveler who goes to Ashkelon in the early 1880s and says he buys over 100 coins for one franc. So, not really worth forging the copper coins, but gold and silver, you have to be on the lookout. You can also get these kinds of gems and seals. Um, here's some examples that were purchased, I think, at Damascus, but you can get things in Palestine proper. But again, you have to be on the lookout. Here is the Seal of David, um, King David, that is. Um, this was offered to Charles Clermont Gonneau when he was working for the PEF in 1874. And I should note, this is offered by Giovanni Battista Albengo, whose name you may remember. He was one of the people recommended to you by that travel guide in 1890. So, just because a travel guide says recommend someone doesn't mean that you are in the clear. You might um, want to collect manuscripts. So, that's maybe a little less common for your ordinary tourist. Maybe most of us wouldn't be able to afford that. But some of the people traveling to Palestine would definitely be getting those. And by 1890, this is another one of the things that's very popular, glassware. Um, this is a set that was purchased around 1900 by the uh, Museum of Antiquities in Leiden. But basically every museum in, that, in this period that we're talking about had to have its um, glass vessels that were coming from somewhere either northern Palestine, south southern Lebanon, and you could get them in the country as well. And of course, there's pottery. Pottery is becoming also popular to collect in this period. Um, here are a series of lamps, one very popular type to collect, that was being um, collected by a man, um, George Robinson Lees, who was at um, the Mission to the Jews in Jerusalem. But of course, once again, we have lots of fakes. Here is, this is a photograph in the PDF archives, um, submitted by Conrad Schick, who was a missionary in Jerusalem, also worked as an engineer and an archaeologist, and he was very proud of these antiquities that he had acquired in 1892, but almost everything here was probably fake. So, you really do need to be on the lookout. This is such a problem, in fact, that you see in your travel guide here, Baedekers, they warn you, um, caution the inexperienced traveler against purchasing any of the imitations which are now largely manufactured in that country, um, Syria, Palestine, and in Egypt. So, you have to be on your lookout. Now, buying even fake antiquities isn't necessarily a bad thing in the eyes of some people. It depends how you look at it. So this is a wonderful quote. Um, it's a little bit extended, so bear with me just a minute, because I do really want to read this. There is quite a brisk trade here in antiquities. Whether genuine or spurious, each tourist must decide to his own satisfaction. Travelers are not generally skeptical regarding the genuis, genuineness of the relics offered to them. They have the satisfaction knowing that if they are duped, they can take it out of their friends when they reach home. Then, the value of their cabinet is enhanced by believing everything that the dealer says regarding his wares and adding such interesting things as may occur to them. My collection from Palestine is greatly increased in worth since its purchase, for I have, as it were by inspiration, 
discovered certain important facts connected with the specimens that the fertile brain of the connoisseur had not invented. After returning to my native land, I was gratified with the discovery that I had in my possession the original scroll which Ezekiel cast into the fire. The particular coin of which the Savior said, rent to under Caesar the things that are Caesar's, the veritable phylactery worn by Aaron, the five lamps used by the wise virgins, the exact mite which the widow cast into the treasury, the stone with which David slew Goliath, a copper duplicate of a golden calf, and a variety of noted antiquities. When a friend has covertly expressed a doubt of the authenticity of any of these relics, I've withered the skeptic, the sarcastic question, if these are not the genuine articles, where are they? This argument is unanswerable. When one incredulous person called attention to the difference in the patterns of five lamps as an evidence that they could not have been used in the same locality or age, I smothered his disbelief with the remark, little do you know, female character, if you think those virgins would have lamps of the same pattern. <laughs> so even if you buy fake antiquities, you could turn it to your advantage. All right. So now we've bought our antiquities. We've got our souvenirs. Now we have to bring them home. Well, we look in our guidebook, get some advice on what to do. We see this. The exportation of antiquities is entirely prohibited. What are we going to do? We've bought all this stuff. Now we want to bring it home. How are we going to do that? Well, um, first we should note that antiquities laws, um, so Palestine is, of course, part of the Ottoman Empire in this period, and the Ottomans uh, enacted their first antiquities law in 1869 and had a series um, after the one, if we're there in 1890, the one we care about is in 1884 on the right, and we see Article 8, it is entirely prohibited to export antiquities discovered in the Ottoman Empire. And there's like no question here. Um, if you buy, you can buy all the antiquities you want to, you can't get them home. What are you going to do? Well, luckily, our handy Baedeker's guidebook here gives us uh, some advice. We read, the traveler is therefore liable to another examination of the country, but he will generally have no difficulty in securing exemption in the way above indicated. Now, what is the way above indicated? In all these cases, a bakshish of a few francs will generally assure the traveler against molestation. But it should, of course, not be offered too openly or the presence of superior officials. So, and this is a remarkable thing to me, stepping outside of 1890 here for, for a minute. Um, here we have a travel guide opening, opening, excuse me, openly telling you that exporting antiquities, bringing them home is for illegal, and then telling you how to bribe the customs officials so you can get them out illegally. Um, I can't imagine Baedeker's doing that today, but <laughs> in the 19th century, that was a thing. Um, and you know what? People did these kinds of things. So for instance, here is John Pennett Peters working for the University of Pennsylvania at the time. He had been conducting um, an exhibition, excuse me, an excavation at Nippur, uh, in what's now Iraq. And he also bought some antiquities at Palmyra in Syria. And he wants to bring them home. And what is he going to do? He says they would have simply been seized by the customs authorities of Beirut if he tried to send them off to Constantinople. Um, on the other hand, the customs authorities were willing, in consideration of a very moderate bakshish, to pass them out of the country. They even assured them against seizure by themselves depositing caution money is a guarantee of their good faith. There we go. Or sometimes you can get by with a certain route. So for instance, we have um, a couple of women who are scholars and manuscript collectors trying to get some Hebrew fragments out of the country. And they get seized at the customs office in Jaffa. So what happens? The dragoman thinks very quickly and says, well, and he thinks because, you know, there's an exemption for the Bible and the Quran. So he says, these are prayer books. They pray in Hebrew. So this, is how we're gonna, this is how they got their ancient manuscripts, or their medieval manuscripts in this case, out of the country. Um, now, of course, because there is such an appetite um, for buying antiquities from travelers like us, from the museums in Europe or the United States that want to collect these things, we start seeing all these warnings um, in the 1890s about looting going on um, in parts of Palestine. Um, local villagers start going through tombs in particular because that's where you can find your pottery, your glass objects very easily, and they provide them to merchants and dealers in a place like Jerusalem or export merchants on the coast to send off to Europe. 
And this is kind of the, let's say, the underside of that antiquities trade that we are a part of um, as we try to bring our souvenirs home. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and if you have any questions uh, or comments, I'd be happy to hear them. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for a fantastic talk. Um, shall I let you think up some questions? I've got a million, um, so if you don't mind, I'll take my prerogative and start. Could you maybe tell us a little bit more about the industry behind some of these fake antiquities? Mm -hmm. Do we know who's producing them? Do you have any idea about quantities? Um, how do they get the expertise to produce these objects? What are their dissemination routes? All the, the gory oh, details. Oh, that, that, that's, that's a lot of questions in one. Sorry, <laughs> that, that was really well done. Yeah, no, that was really well done. You have like, like several questions <laughs> in one. So um, I would say in general, we don't know exactly who they are because a lot of 19th century sources have this very bad habit of not naming people, especially when it comes to... Um, Local people in the country, they don't like to name them. Um, in a few cases, we do know because there was, in the 1870s, there were some very f infamous cases in Jerusalem of a series of forged stone inscriptions and then thousands of the so-called Moabite pottery and Moabitica, of which you can see a couple of examples on display over there. Um, and we know about the people who were behind those. So there was a Jerusalem stonemason named Martin Bulos, and there was a um, Christian Arab icon painter named Salim Al-Kari who made this pottery. And he partnered with um, a couple of different Jerusalem potters to bake all of these clay objects. Um, and in that case in particular, there seems to have been a very large, um, you might call it a conspiracy even, just of like a b whole bunch of people who were involved in um, making this and selling it. Um, in those cases, once there started to be doubts about the antiquity of the stuff, in the, in the case of the Moabite pottery, there would be expeditions that would go east of the Jordan, where it had supposedly been found, and they would go and dig the stuff up that had obviously been planted there beforehand. And so you had to have the people who were going there to plant it, you had the people on this expedition who were part of this whole thing. So you had this really large network of people that was involved in those cases. Um, and so... Um, in other cases, too, we know, so one of those, um, those, those, those Moses coins that we saw, the specific one that was illustrated there was supposedly bought from a peasant outside Gaza, I think. So apparently, and we read about this happening in places outside of Palestine, you have um, the forgeries being made in like the large cities, but then they're distributed out into the countryside because it's easy to sell them there. No one's suspecting that some random farmer in, you know, some village outside Gaza is going to be selling you some fake antiquity. They're not going to be making them there. Um, did that answer most of what you yeah, asked? Absolutely did, yeah. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah. Um, other questions, please? Anne? Um, a really simple question, maybe? I don't know. Um, curious what happens if you couldn't break your way out of keeping your antiquities. If you, they, if you couldn't? If you couldn't, yeah. Ah. Um... I don't know of a case of a traveler not being... So, that says a lot. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, so this is one thing I haven't paid too much attention to, so it's possible it did happen. I just haven't, like, I haven't paid as much attention as they have to the actual like, purchase of these things. Um, I do know that the officials would come down, or the authorities would come down fairly hard on um, local residents who had these things if they were looking to sell them. And so they would seize the objects. They, they would, might find people or even put them in prison. Um, but I don't, know about tra I don't know of cases of travelers who... Um, sometimes things would be occasionally be seized, um, but I don't know of anything beyond that. And usually I don't, I don't know if they had that much of a problem. Yes. European and American museums have big collections of stuff, which they often bought from dealers. I wonder how cautious and careful they were on the origin of the stuff they bought. Um, I don't think I they were. They would be today. Yeah, yeah. No, that wasn't a problem. They, but... Um, they, they were very aware of what was going on. They knew the laws and they knew how these, how these things were being um, found and being sent out of the country and they, for the days, they generally did not care. Um, in some cases, they would actively encourage the looting of sites because that would get them more objects for themselves. Um, so yeah, very different situation. So you had some there. very well-known dealers, didn't you? I mean, I'm thinking of Egypt in particular, mm -hmm. Italians who were bringing enormous amounts of that, almost under contract to provide stuff to the Louvre and to oh, Turin. Yeah, absolutely. You have you don't have so much in Palestine itself, but you have 
in what's now Lebanon. There were some well-known dealers and they were even doing things like looting the sites themselves, mm-hmm. um, going down into what's now the northern part of Israel. And then they would make contact with these different museums and would ship or even bring the stuff over themselves. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. It's very stimulating. And the, at the time of the Crusades, I mean, going back a long, long way, there was a huge interest in, in, in identifying and bringing back religious, uh, particularly Christian, sort of paraphernalia, the original cross, the original crown of thorns, the original the, the shroud, and all this stuff. And of course it got, I'm sure money changed hands, but it ended up in churches all around, all around Western Europe. And I was intrigued to see in your, in your um, lecture that there was a similar thing carrying on in the 19th century, apparently, with um, the stone that the Lyoth killed with, and so on and so forth. I mean, was that just an isolated thing, or did this process of sort of religious paraphernalia and bringing it back for religious purposes, I mean, the idea of bringing it back and selling it to a church in order that the church, I mean, they had a very good reason for doing it, apart from any belief they had, of course, is it brought pilgrims, and pilgrims on money in a big way in, in Western Europe. And if you've got a church which has got the original whatever, you know, that's going to bring hunters in. And I wondered if that really carried on in the 19th century or if that fizzled out 500 years earlier. Um, I'm, that's a good question. I'm sure it wasn't to the same extent, but it's a little hard to answer that. So, for instance, in that passage that we read, he's obviously being somewhat sarcastic. And this is kind of a typical attitude for, say, a Protestant traveler. And most of um, well, certainly the tourists that we're talking about are Protestants, and they d- don't, they are very um, um, condescending towards um, kind of the, 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 the local view of relics and superstitions as they view them and so forth. Um, on the other hand, you have a lot of pilgrims who are coming, um, and they would have a different attitude towards those kind of things, but um, I at least don't have access to accounts of their travels so much so very few like some some let's say french catholic pilgrims accounts but in terms of all these these like orthodox pilgrims i can't really tell you what they were doing and they may have been doing stuff like that but i would imagine they'd be more sophisticated by the 19th century they would be but you think you, you think of the absurd things that people buy today you really uh, I, Were there um, collectors who lived in the country, either Europeans who had settled there or local people who, who made collections? Yes, there definitely were. Um, there were a, a def- basically, if you were a European or an American who was resident in the country for some period of time, there was a good chance that you were a collector, at least on a small scale. But there were some collectors who had collected thousands of objects while they lived in the country. Um, so, for instance, uh, I'm coming to you from um, Norway, and one of the largest collections that was made in the country in this period happens to be now at the University of Oslo, of all places. It was formed by a um, Baron um, von Ustinov, who was originally a Russian aristocrat, who was then went to exile and became a German aristocrat, um, hence von Ustinov. Um, and he lived in Jaffa for several decades and amassed this large collection of thousands of antiquities and a large portion of it ended up at the University of Oslo. Um, and there are other cases like that from, um, either, you know, missionaries, clergymen, or, um, say consular officials in particular. Um, in terms of local residents who are collecting, we know much, I know much less about that. I think there are, there are kind of hints in the sources, but the sources I'm looking at are mostly um, European sources, so you get a lot less information about that. But especially if we talk about things like manuscripts, for instance, then you're definitely going to be, have a lot of interest among um, local residents of places like Jerusalem. We've mentioned today a few times. Would you care to say something about what's going on with this trade in the Holy Land in 2023? Is it still as pernicious, as widespread as it was in the 1890s? Well, that's, that's a good question. What's interesting is, so you go to Israel today and there is a legal trade in antiquities. And in some respects, it is less strict. The laws about it are less strict than they were 
in the late 19th century. Um, you can export your items out of the country, that's not illegal. Um, but in theory, you're supposed to have um, some kind of a, you need some kind of a permit. Um, the dealer you're buying from has to be licensed. Um, the goods have to be inventoried. Um, and while in theory this happens, in practice there are a lot of ways around it. And because Israel has a legal trade in antiquities and a lot of the, and the surrounding countries generally don't, um, what ends up happening is a lot of items that are looted from other countries end up getting um, brought into Israel so they can be laundered as legal antiquities. Mm -hmm. um, so you have, you have a lot of looting still happening. You have a lot of sale of antiquities that were originally, their original acquisition was illegal, but they're laundered through this process and so you can legally get them out of the country. Terrifying to think of laundering of antiquities, isn't it? Um, anyway, uh, Nicholas. Yes, I was. Um, I was just making a comment that um, what was the average value of, of these things that were sold? It seems as though they were fairly low value. Whereas nowadays, I mean, when they do get these antiquities, like you know the tomb of you know the coffin of Jesus, you know, um, this is big bucks. I mean, it is really. I mean, it's a race between the um the Israel Antiquities authorities with their with their high high grade chemistry and everything else and the forgers who were trying to be one step ahead of them. Whereas mm -hmm. it seems there it was it was fairly low level. Well um there was a there was a really a large range. So nineteenth century so most of the stuff that's being purchased is, is low level. Um particularly coins that's the most common thing. But it's actually the same nowadays. So the most common kind of antiquity that you're going to buy you're going to find people buying in Israel today are coins and not necessarily worth all that much. Um, but there are these high-end things as well that's much less common, but they also get much more attention because there's a lot more money involved. They're a lot more um, significant historically. And so they get a lot more attention from the media, from the authorities and so forth. So we hear about those cases more, but... Um, then as now, the largest, um, the most of the transactions going on are small scale and especially things like coins and other kinds of small items. Hey, go on, Anne. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it was, it was not. Um, so you talked a lot about uh, Christian um, relics and uh, buyers. I was wondering, have you looked into, for instance, um, like Jewish pilgrims sounds like a weird thing to say, but Jewish pilgrims in the 19th century and their acquisition of, of antiquities at all. Just curiosity. I haven't. Um, I haven't looked in depth at the sources that would be necessary for that. I've heard a little bit about this just recently, actually, since I've been here. Um, and so it's something I'd like to follow up more that I probably won't have time for in this project. But yeah, um, it's something I don't know much about. So I do either. I do know there are a couple exhibitions for uh, Jewish antiquities. Uh, right at the turn of the century, including one in London um, in 1906. Mm -hmm. So I would be curious to know how many of those, perhaps, <laughs> actually came from from the similar yeah. kind of thing. So, uh, sorry, just a random question. Yeah, no, thank you. Interesting. There's a Jewish museum. You could go and up. They yeah. probably got a lot there. Yeah. Ask him. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you know much about the sort of interest people may have had in the in the context of the objects they were buying, thinking that these were kind of the early days of archaeology or of archaeological exploration of the region. Not that many sites were known, I suppose, or explored if there mm. was, unlike today, where if you bought something, you could actually, we, we just know a lot more about yeah. where this object comes from or, or what its original use was. Was there, was there a relationship between site and object, I suppose? Um, that the buyers would have been aware of. Yeah, um, yeah so not so much. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, you're when you're dealing thing with things like coins, which are the most common thing, you can't, you're not going to be able to um, tie those to a specific site because those are circulating. Um, but uh, in a lot of cases, people wouldn't have known. Um, they would, like stylistically, you wouldn't be able to tell because things simply weren't understood so well. So for instance, when we, if we talk about the, the Moabite pottery, um, the reason that people could tell that those were fake is because of the inscriptions on them, because um, epigraphy and philology were decently well developed in that period. But since archaeology has started and there was almost no knowledge of what pottery looked like or what figurines looked like, 
um, they had no way of knowing if these were anything like what Moldavites actually would have had. Um, so stylistically, you wouldn't have been able to tell. Stories circulated from the um, because dealers who were buying these things from the people who were looting them would might say where they came from, and so in that respect, you might have information on um, where they came from. But even in the 19th century, people start questioning those kinds of stories that dealers tell and saying that they're not reliable. Was there another side to bringing antiquities from this part of the world to the West? That is, of course, the archaeologists themselves. Petrie, for example, uh, for most of his career, funded his next dig by <laughs> selling the antiquities that he had dug up in his previous dig. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but <laughs> yeah. quite a lot of them. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's, um, it's sort of nice to condemn, but it's, uh, it was certainly a shared responsibility. And, and certainly, you may say that, uh, I mean, I'd just be interested to know in, in also at, at what point that stopped. As far as I'm aware, it really stopped in about 1926, following the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun, which really, if you look at our own collection of objects here, it just stops. 1926 was nothing after that. Well, uh, well so what's really interesting that you bring this up, so, you know, Petrie worked for the PEF at um, Tallahassee, which he misidentified as Lachish, and for one season in 1890, and then went back to Egypt. And I think one of the reasons that he did that is because when he was digging in Palestine, he couldn't bring any of his items to Europe. And he even com he complains about um, like publicly about the antiquities law at the time. Um, and back in the mid 1920s, when this is going on in Egypt, this is precisely the time when Petrie moves from Egypt back to Palestine, <laughs> because now in Pal so so in Egypt the laws have tightened up, but in Palestine under the British you have looser antiquities laws and you can now export things again. So Petrie's now back in Palestine doing that. Um, the other side though, to, um, to complicate matters further um, in how we look at this, one of the things that you get from studying the antiquities trade, and you can see that kind of um, throughout this lecture, is that you have a lot of people who are cooperating with your, a lot of people who are local to the region who are cooperating with Europeans to get this stuff out of the country. Um, you have a number of dealers, and then if you count the people who are looting the sites, you have thousands of people who are involved in this um, antiquities industry. Um, and the people who are trying to prevent it are the Ottomans, who are not local at all. They're an empire based in Istanbul, in Constantinople. So um, it complicates matters further as to, um, it may have been illegal, but what do we think about the ethics of the situation? I think that's a good place to pause um, and to thank Michael so much for this wonderful talk. And we'll continue the conversation over refreshments, but let's thank him again. Thank you so much.